Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? My name is Justin Anderson, and uh, I'm a pastor. Uh, have been a pastor down in the valley. I realized that uh, everyone, I've had people ask me, well, so where are you a pastor? So for the last seven years, seven years ago, I planted a church in Tempe. I started one from scratch in Tempe um, and, and kind of pastored that for the last seven years and then actually uh, announced in the fall that I was going to be leaving that church to go start a new church. Um, and so this spring, in the next couple of months, um, my wife and I and our kids are going to move to San Francisco um, to start a new church. And so um, come visit us because uh, we'll be lonely because there's going to be like six of us there and, and we're going to be pretending we have a church. Uh, but uh, it's, it's going to be fun. So um, in the meantime, I'm free to come up here and hang out and enjoy the cold weather and bug you guys. Uh, so uh, I think I'm up here at least one more time, once in February. And... Um, A lot of people fans of February, huh? All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Uh, if you do not have a Bible, go ahead and raise up your hand. One of the ushers will bring you a Bible. If uh, you don't own a Bible, please keep this one. Um, and I, I realized after the last service that I've just been kind of volunteering that on behalf of the Heights Church. And uh, so I told Ty, I said, hey, are you cool with me doing that? He's like, no, not at all. You owe us. And he had a bill for me, and it was... It was a little awkward, but um, please keep that Bible if you don't own a Bible. Um, he said he'll just take it out of my honorarium, um, which I'm totally cool with. Um, if you do own a Bible and you just didn't bring it today, uh, first of all, shame on you. Uh, it's church. Um, that's when you bring your Bible, okay? And so um, dust, off the, dust off the dust and, uh, and bring your Bible. To church. You should bring it other places too, but at least to church. Okay, so um, we are in Matthew chapter 3. So if you want to turn there, Matthew's the first book in your New Testament. We are in the midst of a series called 31. And it is 30 weeks about one thing, and that one thing is Jesus. And so we start in the Old Testament and have been going for quite some time. The last three weeks, we've been looking at the life of Jesus in the Gospels. Uh, Pastor Randy Murphy did the first week and taught um, very effectively on the humanity of Jesus, talking about that he really was human, which I don't think for most of us today, that's a big question mark. I think the bigger question mark in our culture, um, though it's been different over the years, throughout the centuries, um, it's changed. But right now, I think the bigger question was, was Jesus divine? Was he actually divine? People can get their heads around him being human. Um, but was he divine? And so we talked about that last week. Um, and if you weren't here, it was phenomenal. Um, I, I recommend you getting the, getting the CD. It was a joke because it was me being phenomenal. But nonetheless, um, this, week, uh, this week, we're kind of looking at the two together. Um, the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus, how that, how that exactly worked out, um, and in a kind of a practical moment in um, Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, which is what we'll see in, in chapter 4 of Matthew. But I want to give us a little context, so we're going to start with the baptism in chapter 3. But there's this weird preaching thing that happens. It's, it's a kind of part of the preacheritis, um, that whenever you know what you're going to be preaching in a given week, and that topic's in your head, especially when it's kind of a topical thing like this, um, it seems like God brings examples into your life um, to be illustrations. And it may just be that you're more aware of it, um, and it may just may be moments when God does crazy stuff to give you something worthwhile to say um, on stage. This was one of those moments where I hoped that God would not do that since I'm talking about temptation, right? And so I'm like, great, I'm going to be tempted all week, and I'm going to have to overcome all that temptation. And, and so I did. I, I didn't sin at all this week. Uh, but, <laughs> but yesterday, yesterday, as we're coming up, my, my, both of my kids have been sick. And, and you know when you got six, sick kids, it's just it's a pain in the neck. And so I have a three-and-a-half-year-old daughter and a six-month-old son. And so my son was the pain in the neck last night, didn't sleep at all, which means, of course, we didn't sleep either. Um, and my daughter, yesterday, we're, we're driving up, and she's kind of been sick, but she's pretty much kind of getting over it, but still kind of cranky, plus she's three and a half. And uh, just, just by the way, whoever came up with the phrase terrible twos must have just run out on his family before his kids became three. 
Three is so much worse. Two, they're crawling, they're all over the place, they're dirty and messy, big deal, you hose them off, it's not a problem. But three is unbelievable. My daughter has become a demon, and she's manipulative and emotional, and it's unbelievable. I mean, willful disobedience, you see the evil in her eyes, it's horrible. And so I, I, thought, I thought I had a while till the kind of emotional girl stuff started coming out. I figured I'd had till she was, I don't know, 28 or whatever, but three. Three years old. I'm like, this is brutal. So we're driving up here, and we told her, listen, if you will take a nap in the car, just sleep a little bit in the car. You won't have to take a nap when we get to the hotel. But if you don't, you're, you are going to have to lay down in the hotel. Okay, got it, Daddy. Thanks. We get out of Phoenix. I'm like, all right, we're about a quarter of the way there. Just so you know, just going to give you an update. Remember, if you don't sleep. And so she starts to pull these. She go, Daddy, I'm sleeping, and go, I go, no, that, you're not sleeping. You're a dirty liar. That is not sleeping. Stop. Just stop. That does not count. And so the whole time up, we're getting off at Cordes Junction. I'm like, this is last chance, right? Like, you better be asleep right now or else you're, you're done. So we get to the hotel. She didn't sleep at all in the car. We get to the hotel. We go, okay, it's time for a nap. And it's just tantrum, meltdown. We put her in the, in her, in the bed and just say, listen, you just got to lay there. And you, you play mind tricks with these kids and you feel like, you feel so stupid. But you go, okay, you don't have to sleep. You just have to lay there quiet with your eyes closed. That's all. And they're like, oh, all right. You know, but already she knows that I'm manipulating her. And so, you know, she's just melting down and crying. And usually, you know, you're at home. You just shut the bedroom door. You go out in the backyard and you pretend like she's not there. But... <laughs> Right? That's what we all do? Yeah. All right. Just making sure I'm not getting, like, child protective services called on me here. But we're in a hotel, and so I'm sensitive to the other guests, and I'm trying to kind of finalize my notes here, make sure I got it all. And so I'm just in the next room in, in the hotel, in, in the same room, just there's a door. And, and so... Um, I, you know, I can't ignore her, so I go in. I'm like, please, please, I'm begging you, please, just, you know, I'm, I'm throwing candy at her. Just be quiet. Just don't. And then they start to have tantrums, and I hear, thump, ah! you know, and the real cry, not the whine anymore. And so she's thrashing around and smacks her head on the headboard. And so, of course, I go in, and I go, what happened? I hurt my head. I said, was it because you were having a tantrum? Yeah, good. And, I, you know, you just walk out, and you're like, you deserve it. And, and it, what's crazy about these moments is you feel this, this stuff coming out of you and you hear these things come just coming out that you have no idea. That, that's like, I, I, I swore I would never say that. Like, you want a reason to cry? I'll give you a reason to cry. You're like, all these flashbacks coming back like, oh, you think that hurt? That ain't nothing. I'll show you pain, girl. You know, it's just like, oh, it just comes out of you in those moments. And so... Um, so temptation towards anger and temptation towards, um, uh, I don't know, physical pain and things like that uh, was strong uh, yesterday. And of course, I'm a pastor, so I didn't do it. But um, nonetheless, um, it gave me some good, good uh, very vivid illustration of the way that Satan tempts us to anger and to self-righteousness and some of these things. Jesus, though... Um, was, was never, would never succumb to that temptation. How's that for a transition? Um, we see in Hebrews chapter 2, um, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 2 and, and chapter 4, both comment kind of on this story. In fact, so Hebrews 2.18 says, Therefore, he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted, right? So the high priest stood as this intermediary between God and the people. And, and because the high priest was always a human, fully human, only human, there was, it was essentially only a ceremonial go-between. He could provide some of the sacrifice and some of those things. But Jesus, the writer of Hebrews tells us, was the ultimate high priest because he actually was all God and all man. We're, we're not talking about some kind of Frankenstein God where it's half God, half man, half something else. This is 100% God, 100% man, and all the math nerds went, well, that's not possible. It's 200%. That doesn't work. God invented math, so be quiet, all right? So uh, it, 
he is fully God and fully human. So he is the perfect high priest because he can literally be a go-between because he fully understands humanity and all the suffering and all the temptation and all of that and fully understands from the perspective of God and what God's um, uh, expectations are and, and the holiness of God and all those things. So the writer of Hebrews says, he was made in every way like us, and he was tempted and he suffered in his temptation just like we do. And then in Hebrews 4, 14, said, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and here's the key point, yet without sin yet without sin. So this series is about who is Jesus, get to know Jesus, make sure we know this Jesus that we're supposed to be following and supposed to believe in if, if you are here today and you are a believer, though I know some of you are not. And so this can serve as a, a, as a bit of a primer, a primer on who was Jesus for those of you who do not know, but those of you who are following Jesus, you ought to know who it is you're following and, and what that means. So um, what's nice about a passage like this is that because temptation is such a universal human experience, that we can look at who Jesus was and what that means, but also take it the next step to go, okay, well, what does that mean for me? How, how does that affect me? It's great to know that Jesus was fully human. It's great to know that Jesus was fully divine. And it's great to know that he was the perfect combination of this two. The theologians call the hypostatic union of these two things. But what does that actually mean? Okay, well, according to Hebrews, what this means is that because Jesus was made in every way like us and he endured temptation just like we endure temptation, yet without sin, that we ought to be able to look at Jesus' life, how he combated temptation, how he overcame temptation, and we should be able to follow in his footsteps. Okay, so it can be an example for us, but then it's also much more than that for us. So we'll, we'll get to that at the end. So what I want to do is start in Matthew chapter 3. Verse 13, read about the baptism and transition right into the temptation. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now, this is clearly a story of Jesus' life, but I think um, it is also for us a, a type or a model for how Satan tempts us in general. Right? So I, I don't think, um, and, I, and I'll show you why I don't think this, but I don't think that this was a particular temptation for Jesus that doesn't apply to us. I think that this is big categories of how Satan tempts all of us, and here's why. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, the very first temptation, says this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So there's three things that Adam and Eve saw in the tree, in the fruit of the tree, that made them rebel against God. So if you don't know the story, God creates this perfect Eden, this perfect garden where Adam and Eve have no needs, have nothing that's withheld from them, save the fruit of one tree. 
They have a perfect relationship with God, a perfect relationship with one another, perfect relationship with nature. They couldn't ask for anything. God simply said, if you want to be in relationship with me, just don't eat from this one tree. That's it. Every other tree is fine, just not this one tree. And of course, they were tempted. They failed this test in the garden about the tree. Um, and they ate of the fruit. And it was three things that Eve saw that the fruit was good for food, delight to the eyes, and desire to make one wise. Okay? John, the Apostle John, in 1 John chapter 2, gives us similar categories when talking about worldliness. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Okay, so we've got these three categories in Genesis 3. We've got the same three categories in 1 John 2. The category is essentially body, stuff, and pride. Right? Attacks, spiritual attack, temptation on our body, temptation towards things that we can uh, accumulate, and, and pride of reputation and who we are. And we see the same three things in this temptation of Jesus. That Satan says, turn these stones into bread. Temptation for the body. He says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you will just worship me. This possessions, things. And he goes, if you will just throw yourself down from this temple, everyone will think you're great. Everyone will worship you. Pride, you'll have this great reputation. The same three categories that we see. So I really think these three categories, and I've added one on the front end that we'll see in a moment, um, really are the ways that Satan attacks us. Now, the reason I think it's important to know this is if you've ever read um, C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters, um, and, the, and I have a quota of mentioning C.S. Lewis at least once in every sermon, just so you know. Um, but if you've ever read Screw Tape Letters, um, it, it's certainly C.S. Lewis isn't the Bible, but he's the next best thing, right? So um, he does this phenomenal job of giving us a perspective on spiritual warfare and the strategies of Satan and demons that is just eye-opening to be able to see how things in your life are working against you. And so that's kind of what I want to do is open our eyes to be able to take a step back and go, wow, yeah, I do, I I am tempted in these three areas or four that that I'll add on the front end so that we can be aware of what's going on around us and not attribute temptation to something else, to something that's not Satan, so we're not on our guard, okay? So four things. One, Satan attacks our identity, Right after Jesus comes up out of the water, right? He's being baptized, comes up. The the dove descends upon him. We talked about that last week. The voice of God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Right? Immediately, the spirit leads Jesus out into the wilderness. And what's the first thing Satan says? If you truly are the son of God, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple Satan questions Jesus' identity. Are you really who you say you are? And I think this is a critical attack that Satan uses against us to question our identity, especially as believers, perhaps in the midst of sin, after we have just sinned for the nth time in the same way, Satan comes in and whispers in our ears, says, are you really a Christian? Come on. I mean, you you have sinned in this way so many times. How can you call yourself a Christian? The Bible says that when you're a Christian, you're a new creation, but you don't seem new. You seem like the same old you, sinning in the same ways. You come home after a long day at work, and your house is crazy, and you get angry at your wife, and you get angry at your kids. How's that that any different? How's that new creation? How can you call yourself a child of God? How can you say that you're a new creation? How can you say that you're forgiven? Because not only have you sinned in the same way a hundred times this year, but you know you're going to have this moment where you go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, wife. I love you. And you're going to maybe cry some big crocodile tears. And then next week you're going to do it again. You know you're going to. And Satan attacks our identity. It says, how, how can you truly say it? See, the Bible makes all these amazing claims about who we are. That when we enter into a relationship with Christ, it says that we're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. It says that we are adopted into God's family as sons. And this is meaningful. So no matter whether you are a male or a female, you are a son of God in the kingdom. Because in this culture, a son was the one that, that got all of the rights to the family name, that would get all of the rights to the throne, that this, being the eldest son, being the son meant a position of power, a position of influence. It meant that you were the closest to the father. 
And God goes, my people are all my sons, heirs to the throne, heirs to the rights of the king. That's who you are. So the Bible makes all these claims about who you are, what your identity, your new identity is, and Satan comes in and attacks those. He attacks not only by questioning whether or not you are actually a child of God, but he attacks your identity by trying to get you to focus on other identities and primarily identifying yourself as a husband, a father, a mother, a wife, a worker, a successful businessman, a boss, an athlete, a former athlete. Right? And he gets, tries to get you to primarily identify as these other things more so than identifying as a child of God. And so here, here's what happens. So say your primary identity is as a worker. And you take great pride in the fact that you are a great worker. You take great pride in the fact that you are a boss. And so as long as you're the boss, and as long as being the boss is going really well, you get very proud and perhaps very arrogant and very self-righteous and very confident in yourself. But what happens the day you get fired because the economy turned? What happens the day that you make a mistake and you're no longer the boss? And your whole identity was wrapped up in the fact that you're the boss, you're in charge. And now you are no longer. What hasn't changed is that you are still a child of God, but that doesn't matter to you. Because you've been convinced that the most important identity that you have is that of boss, or that of worker, or that of husband, or that of wife, or that of mother. And so when your children rebel against you and don't love you or don't like you or don't act like they like you, you're crushed by it because that's your identity. So not only does Satan attack whether or not we are even children of God, but he just tries to get our focus off of the identity that never changes. The identity that's true, that Christ died for us, that we are his children, and that never changes. Everything else changes, and thus provides an opportunity for us to be crushed or to be arrogant. But being a child of God means that we were simply aware enough of our sin to humble ourselves and go, I can't do it, I need you. And that never changes. Number two, Satan attacks our flesh. And I think this is the one that's probably most obvious to us, right? He comes to Jesus when Jesus is most weak after 40 days of fasting. I don't know, have any of you ever fasted for 40 days? This is your moment to brag. This is it. boy. Nice work, a couple of you. Any fasted for a week, two weeks, a day, 15 minutes? No, okay. <laughs> Excellent. I can say this. I fasted for 40 days before and and. It is, it's horrible um, in, in every possible sense of the word. Um, after about 10 days, your body just rebels just because I hate you, and it, you stop kind of being hungry, um, and it just becomes mental. All these temptations are mental. You see a burrito, and your soul craves a burrito. It just, it craves rice and beans. You wake up in the middle of the night, rice and beans, rice and beans, and that, that's all you want, and it just, it overcomes you. I, there is a, a real, not only a physical weakness, but an emotional, a spiritual weakness when you, um, when you fast. And that's kind of the whole point, to put, make yourself more dependent um, upon the Lord in that season. Right? So Satan waits until after 40 days to come to Jesus and attack him, to tempt him. And what's his first temptation? Man, Jesus, you've got to be hungry. You've got to be hungry. How about you just turn those stones into bread? Now, people have argued, well, Jesus couldn't have turned the stones into bread because it would have been dipping into his divinity, and we know he didn't do that. No, that's garbage. Because Jesus turned water into wine, multiplied fish and bread to feed 5,000 people, and raised a dude from the dead, right? Stone to bread, that's nothing. He could do that in his sleep. He didn't do it to make, to, to make two statements. One, I don't obey you, Satan. I obey God and the will of God. So you can tempt me with whatever you want, but God didn't tell me to turn those stones into bread, so I'm not going to do it. Wouldn't have been anything bad about him doing that. But I think more importantly, in light of his response, saying, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on the very words that proceed from the mouth of God. To say there is a, a deeper spiritual reality. There's something more profound in the universe than just my flesh. And yet, it, without a constant reiteration of that in our minds, without proactively seeking out that which is spiritual, that which is invisible, we can very easily forget and very easily focus simply on our flesh because it's all around us. We feel hunger pangs. 
We feel when we're sick. We feel sexual desire. We feel these things. They're all around us. It's, it's, it's what's tangible and real to us. And so the temptation is to value that which is physical more than anything else. Right? So we all know what our, where our areas of weakness are and where they're not. And everybody is tempted in different ways. Right? Like I, I have never in my life been tempted towards alcoholism. I just never have. But I know that a lot of you in here struggle with that. And we all struggle with different things. We all struggle with them to different degrees. And Satan knows every, every one of them. He doesn't come to Jesus after 40 days of fasting and with a beautiful woman and go, hey, Jesus, what do you think? Jesus is hungry. So Satan comes with stones to turn into bread. He goes, I know where you're weak right now. So not only does he tempt us where we are weak, but he tempts us when we are weak. In those moments of extra weakness, he tempts us. So it, we've got all kinds of physical stuff. Maybe you're, you're drawn to alcoholism. Maybe you're drawn to sexual promiscuity. Maybe you're drawn to all these things. But you know what they are. And you know that this is one of the big categories that Satan tempts us is with our body. Right? It's good for food. Desires of the flesh. Genesis talks about it. First John talks about it. Satan tempts Jesus the same way. Second, attacking our pride. He says, he will command his angels concerning you. And Satan does a devious thing here. After Jesus quotes scripture to, to ward off the first temptation, Satan quotes scripture back to him, Psalm 91. But if you go read Psalm 91, Satan twisted, to no surprise, twisted the meaning of Psalm 91. And took what, what the psalmist says, which is, if you were to trip and fall, if you strike your foot on a stone and fall, God will be there. He will care for you. He's a good God. He will protect you. And Satan twists it to go, hey, if you throw yourself down, God will grab you. God will pick you up. And so he starts to play on Jesus' temptation towards pride. As a human, has a temptation towards pride, has a proclivity towards pride. He says, man, imagine if you were to be at the top of the, of the temple and threw yourself down to the bottom. At the bottom, they'd be overlooking the Kidron Valley. It'd be about 300 feet down. He goes, imagine if you jumped off and then just kind of slowly floated to the ground and landed. I mean, people would be like, man, that's crazy. This dude just got baptized. The voice of God spoke, a dove just like hanging out on his shoulder, and now he's jumping off buildings and landing like a butterfly. I'll follow that dude. Right? I mean, Jesus could have, could have skipped over a lot of the scorn and the shame of the beatings and the whippings and the cross and all the negative reputation that went along with that and very easily could have done this great display of power for his own personal glory and it attracted all this attention. Satan's playing on his pride. Like, you could be great, and everyone would know that you're great. And so we do things because Satan's in our ear going, man, if you just did that, if you just said that, remember, he, hey, hey, he just said, raise your hand if you fast for 40 days. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Everyone will know that you're super spiritual. Satan's in our ear going, if you do this right now, everyone will think you're great. Ooh, say this, cut this guy down, it'll be hilarious, and everyone will think you're funny and, and think that guy's lame. Do, do this in this moment, everyone will think you're really smart, even though you copied it from this other guy. Satan's always in our ear, pulling on our pride, telling us to do and to not do things to puff ourselves up. And I think, and this is probably a generalization, but I think men probably deal with this, say a little bit more, as much as anybody. Satan's in our ear going, Real men, don't do this. Right? Any sentence that starts with real men is not true. <laughs> right? It, it is it's just going to be some stereotype that you should reject. Right? Unless it's real men, act like Jesus. Okay. I don't know who fake men are exactly, but nonetheless. We, we're told all these things by our culture. Real men are strong. Real men are stoic. Real men work long hours. Real men make a lot of money. Real men aren't gentle with their wives. Real men don't engage with their kids. Real men, real men, plays on our pride. Yeah, I'm a real man. I'm a manly man. I'm going to do these things. Real men don't serve. Real men lead and fight. Do men do that? Sure. Should men do that? Yeah. 
Should people do that? Sure. But Jesus was the example of leadership through servanthood. Victory through loss. Life through death. Turning all that stuff on its head. Cutting to the core of our pride. Saying essentially, you cannot have relationship with me unless you humble yourself and admit you can't do anything without me. The first shall be last. The leaders are the followers. The kings are the servants. So everything in this world sells us about what it means to be a real man, it's garbage. It's garbage. It's Satan in your ear kind of trying to redefine what that means. It plays on our pride. Lastly, Satan attacks our worship, draws our attention towards stuff. He says to Jesus, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. It's really interesting when you, when you think about this temptation. Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory in whatever miraculous way that happened. And says, I will give you all of these things. Now, there's some question whether or not they were even Satan's to give, but nonetheless. He says, I will give you all these things if you will just fall down and worship me. I know that what you want is to be king over the world. Now, what's ironic in this for us that we know is that Jesus is king over the world. He is king over all the kingdoms, but he won that victory and earned that kingship through death and servanthood and sacrifice and humility. But what Satan does to us is goes, oh, you want comfort and security? You want to be loved and appreciated? You want to be respected? You want to be followed? You want to be feared? Do this. Worship this. Now, very rarely, I think, um, would Satan knock on our front door and go, hey, come worship me. I think most of us would go, nah. That seems like a bad idea. (laughs) And so because um, most of us aren't foolish enough to look at Satan in the face and go, yeah, I'll follow you to get what I want, Satan goes, okay, don't follow me, but just don't follow God. Don't don't worship God. So almost everything that we do is is an act of worship. If we we can define and understand worship far beyond what we do here on a Sunday, but it's the things to which we give our time, our energy, our hearts, our mind, our thought, our anxiety, our passion. These are the things that we value. By bestowing these things on them, we give them value because we give of who we are. I mean, scriptures say that true worship is giving of oneself, a spiritual sacrifice. And so Satan doesn't go, hey, come worship me. But he just says, listen, um, if, if, if we know that the only thing worth truly giving our utmost to is God himself, then anything that supplants God in that highest and best place, we are worshiping. The Bible has a big word for it called idolatry. It talks about idolatry over and over and over and over and over and over. In the Old Testament, idolatry was almost always physical things, right? Jesus, or God leads the people out of slavery in Egypt, and like a week later, they make this little golden calf about this big and go, that's our God. And God's going, are you, are you for real? I led you out of slavery. I parted the Red Sea. There's a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke leading you out, and you think this little golden calf that you just made by throwing your watches into a fire, like that's your God now? So in the Old Testament, it was very physical. In the New Testament, it, it's still physical, but it manifests itself in different ways. And so we idolize money. We idolize people. We idolize jobs. We idolize opportunity. We idolize ideas. Martin Luther said the heart is an idol factory. Saying that what we do is place our value, give our worship to things all around us because there is a promise that that thing will get us what we most ultimately want. So when we idolize a person, say, it's not that we want that person as an end, but we want that person as a means to our end of, say, being loved. And so we give of our time, we give of our energy, we give of our heart, we give of our mind, we give of our thoughts, we give of ourself to a person or a thing in order to get what it promises to give us. And what it promises to give us is our essentially our, 
our functional heaven, what we really want most in this world. So if we want love, we idolize a person. If we want security, we idolize money. If we want to be respected, if we idolize, if we want power, and that's, that's our ultimate heaven, We'll idolize our job that makes us a boss that gives us power over these employees. So we give of ourselves to these things that become essentially functional saviors that promise to get us to a heaven. And Jesus goes, I'm the only savior who can get you to the only and greatest heaven. And so Satan goes, worship me and I'll give you what you want. And every idol in your life makes the same claim. Worship me and I will give you what you want. Love me, sacrifice your life for me, and I will love you back. Work 90 hours a week, and I will give you a pile of money so that you can have a false sense of security. How'd that work out for people in the last five years? Because those things go away, and all of a sudden the heaven's not there, and the Savior failed you, and you're back to square one. It's an issue of worship. So over and over and over in our lives, the same pattern. Satan attacks our identity, attacks our body, attacks our pride, and he attacks our stuff. Saying this is not just stuff, it's worth worshiping. It's worth giving your life to. So how do we overcome? I've got seven ways that we overcome. We've got to keep moving, so let's go. Number one, it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, it says, right at the very beginning of chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness for the sake of this temptation. So it was the will of God that Jesus would be led into this moment of temptation so he could overcome Satan as a model for us, but also to set up the rest of his ministry. And if we can, likewise, be led by the Spirit, and I I would say this is one of the most difficult things to explain what it means to be led by the Spirit or led by the flesh. And the only thing I can say is you can feel it when it's happening. Like in those moments when your kid is screaming and you're angry and it's four o'clock in the morning and you just, it, there's something that anger just wells up in you, starts right about here. I've noticed anger starts here and it just kind of oozes out through your extremities to where you're swinging and cussing. Um, it just, that's, that's the flesh manifesting itself where um, when you're led by the spirit, there is patience and love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness. And so there's these moments where we are being led by the Spirit, and there's moments where we have to ask to be led by the Spirit. So I I don't know if you guys have this up in Prescott, but in in the Valley we have really stupid drivers. I don't know if you guys have that. Um, And they they drive me crazy. When stupid people drive stupidly, um, uh, it it, it makes me angry. And so um, I, I, I feel it welling up in me. And I have to, in those moments, when I, when I feel the flesh in me rising up, and yet I know I want to be led by the Spirit, I will oftentimes say out loud, especially when I'm, mostly when I'm by myself, but say out loud, who do you think you are? Because at the end of the day, that's almost always what it is. It is a, a, a pride issue. You are being stupid to me, and I deserve better than that. And I have to tell myself, Who do you think you are? Not to the other drivers, though often, sometimes that happens. (laughs) I have to say it to myself. Who, Who do you think you are? You think you're so great that you deserve this? You deserve that? You deserve respect? You deserve to be for other people to drive well around you? You deserve for stupid people to stop being stupid? You deserve that? What do you deserve? If we understand our identity, if we understand who we are, if we understand that we are sinners saved by grace, if 
We understand Ephesians 2, that we were dead in our trespasses, but God made us alive, not by anything good we have done, so no one can boast, but Christ in us, then, then if we're honest with ourselves, we should go, I'm lucky God hasn't killed me yet. <laughs> right? And it's those moments when we go, how dare they treat me? How dare they do? How dare they? And we have to stop and go, no, I want to be led by the Spirit, and I want the manifestation of that to be joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Right? Number two, Jesus used the Word of God correctly. Ephesians 6, Paul calls the word of God the sword of the spirit. We've got this armor, and the word of God is the sword. And as I was reading this story, I thought, I wonder how many of us, if we were out in the wilderness fasting for 40 days, and Satan himself came to tempt us, would be able to just whip out verses from Deuteronomy. (laughs) Just knock them down, right? I wonder how many of us know what Deuteronomy is. (laughs) That's a big word. I don't know that one. It's a book in the Bible. The word of God tells us the truth about the world. It it defines reality for us. And so when we have Satan in our ears lying to us, telling us things that are not true, we ought to have, we have to have the word of God in our minds to be able to combat the lies, to go, no, Satan, that's simply not true. What you're telling me about my identity, what you're telling me about my pride, what you're telling me about what I deserve, it's just not true. The word of God speaks the truth about the world, defines reality, written by the creator, the sustainer, the savior of the universe. It defines the truth. And if we don't know it, we don't know the truth, we can't discern what lies are, So we believe the lies. Number three, you have to fight or you will lose. I don't know if you guys have um, hippies up here, but um, we have them in the valley, and uh, they're, they're all about pacifism and all that, and that's great. But if you are a spiritual pacifist, you will just simply be dead. The only spiritual pacifists are dead spiritual pacifists. Paul tells us, In Ephesians chapter 6, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There is a battle. There is a war. It's being brought to you so you can fight or you can die. Number four, if you lose a round of the fight, repent and get ready to fight the next round. This is obviously not from Jesus' life because he did not lose a round, but wisdom from faster. The Christian life is like a long boxing match or MMA fight or whatever works best up here. It's round after round after round after round after round of battle. And you will lose a round. But don't let that KO you for the fight. Don't let the loss of one round go, okay, forget it, I give up. I'm just not even going to worry about that anymore. I'm not going to use my right hand anymore because it just doesn't work anymore. Foolish. Lose the round. Repent of sin. Prepare for the next round. The battle will be brought back to you. Number five, Satan will tap out, but he will be back. So when we fight and we win, we win a battle, he will tap out, he will lose. The temptation will subside, but he will be back where you're weak, when you're weak, once again. So do not let down your guard Remember that there is always a battle, even when you're not feeling temptation. Number six, escape is always possible. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So the question should never be, will I ever overcome this sin? The question should never be, Can I overcome this sin? Can I ever beat this temptation? The question should always be, how? How how am I going to get out of this? How can I get, how can I flee? How can I get through this? How can, where's the open door? Where's the open door? How can I beat this? In fact, the very next verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says, flee therefore from idolatry. I had a, a kid come to me when I was doing college ministry 
who said, Pastor, I, I did what you told me to do, and it totally worked. And I'm going, okay, I've said a lot of things. Hopefully it was one of the good things, right? So <laughs> what did you? He goes, last night I was with my girlfriend, and we were at her apartment. It was really late, and it was just it was going in a bad direction. So I, I fleed from, from that temptation. I said, cool, what, what, what do you mean you fleed? He goes, I got up and I ran out of her apartment. All right. It's a little weird, but uh, good work. Good work. Number seven. Jesus is temptation's final destroyer. Um, Romans chapter five calls Jesus the second Adam, which is an interesting thing. It makes us go back to Genesis chapter three and look at how Adam and Eve failed the test in the garden. They were given one thing, a tree. Jesus said, or God said, pass the test about the tree in the garden. That's all you got to do. And they failed the test. They failed the test about the tree in the garden. And we as humanity have failed that test over and over and over again. But Jesus did not. Jesus passed a very similar test about a tree in the garden. Matthew chapter 26. It says, Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he said again, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Jesus was called to go to a tree that had been turned into a cross. And in spite of the great temptation to fail that testing, in spite of the great pain, the very real pain and suffering he would endure, not only the physical pain of being beaten and being nailed to a cross, but the very real spiritual pain of having all sin, past, present, and future, placed upon him, thus separating him from the Father in ways that he had never experienced before. He passed the test in the garden saying, not my will, not what I want, but what you want. I know that there is a greater end, a greater purpose. And it is because of Jesus' perfect life, his sacrificial death, his miraculous resurrection, that, that the first six ways to overcome temptation even matter. If, if Christ hadn't died on the cross, and he was just a guy who lived a great moral life and left us this example, these six things would be mostly useless to us. They'd work in a moment. They'd work from time to time. They'd work for a little while. They'd be these great how-to strategies. But if Jesus Christ was not fully God and fully man and did not go to the cross to die for sin, and that grace was not extended from the cross, we would have a complete inability to do any of these things ultimately. We would never be able to consistently overcome temptation to sin. And even more than that, when we did fail, we would have no ability to be picked back up again. That sin would be a forever stain on our soul. And yet it is not only the perfect life, sacrificial death, and miraculous resurrection of Christ that matters for temptation, but it is the grace extended to us that each and every time we fail, that grace covers over our sin, and instead of God the Father, the judge, looking at us and seeing our sin, he sees his son whose perfect life has been applied to our own. And he sees us through view of his son. And so we can fight and we can win, but when we lose, we are forgiven and we are covered. And that's the good news. That's the good news about Jesus and his temptation. Let's pray. One of my favorite hymns was written in the late 1800s. It's called Before the Throne of God Above. I want to read to you two stanzas from it as our prayer this morning says, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there, 
who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Jesus, thank you that you lived the life that we were supposed to live. You did so in our place. And you died the death that we were supposed to die. And you did so in our place. Lord, I pray that that truth would penetrate deeply into our hearts. The Spirit would lead us to overcome temptation. But that in those moments of failure, we would not be destroyed by that failure. We would be lifted up by your grace. Not a grace to be abused, but a grace to be celebrated. Thank you for the cross. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.